Yeah. Like a lot of these ex mob guys, yeah. they ratted. Yeah. And we used to have a thing if you inform, you never have a chance to reform. Hello, Tom Levecki here with the latest edition of a special collaboration between New Theory Podcast and Mobsters Inc. We have a very special guest today. And of course, you can tell we are in studio, uh, Flexwork Studio in New Jersey. We have a very special guest today that flew in. Louis Ferrante. And now, now before we jump in, I'm going to surprise him a little bit. And I'm going to make an admission that I've never admitted before. This book, Mob Rules, What the Mafia Can Teach Legitimate Business by Louis Ferrante, is the sole reason why I do podcasts in this space connecting Life of Cosa Nostra and business. Without further ado, Louis Ferrante, welcome to the New Theory Podcast. How are you doing today, buddy? Very good. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for having me. Um, this book I had to pull out of my garage. It's very old. There's a lot of notes. Uh, we'll get into that book and his new book, Borgata, The Rise of an Empire, A History of the American Mafia. And we'll get into that as well. But let's start off, Louis. Tell us about like your formative years. What kind of upbringing did you have and what kind of helped shape the man that you are today? Wow, that's a deep question. Uh, my grew up in Queens. My family, very Italian-American family. Yeah. Uh, the house was very Italian American, yeah. our culture. Yeah. The things we ate, the things we said, the things you know. plastic on the furniture. Oh yeah. <laughs> so you're born with plastic on the furniture. Right. Your, your ass sticks to the couch that's every time you get summer. up. That's, that's right. yeah, that's 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 life in an Italian house. Okay. And uh eventually um, you know, I went out and did my own thing. My yeah. parents did raise me right, but yeah. I went off track. Uh my mother's side of the family was my uncle went away for hijacking okay. when I was young. Yeah. So I grew up in prison visiting rooms. I yeah. was in, you know, visiting him in Sing Sing yeah. while my feet couldn't even touch the floor. Wow. Yeah, you know, I didn't even you know, I'd sit in the, in the back seat on someone's lap on the way to prison to visit him. So, you know, it wasn't like unheard of that there were my mother's side had criminals. My yeah. grandfather took numbers. Yeah. My grandfather was a World War II hero. Oh, well, God Eight bless. bronze stars, Asiatic Pacific, came home, God bless. got in the union. The mob guys got him in. He yeah. ran heavy machinery, yeah. operating engineers union, and he took numbers at night at yeah. a bar. But they were not they were not mafia. Yeah. They were just knock around guys. Yeah. Uh, guys. My father's side were law abiding people. Yeah. yeah. They would never even drive fast. Wow. My father's side, completely different. Yeah. Um my mother's side was Sicilian and Abidan. My okay. father's side was Bares. Okay. Uh so oh, but I said beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And uh good people. Yeah. Yeah. Salt of the earth, hard workers. Yeah. Um, like I said, no crime, nothing. Yeah. Uh, when I did probably about 13, 12, 13, started stealing cars yeah. for a joy ride, you know, doing donuts in the parking lot, yeah. have some fun, dump the car when we're done, finished, go home. And then at some point or another, a friend of mine's uncle wanted parts from us, from a car. I saw us in a stolen car. So yeah. I'll take the parts. We, we gave him the parts. We started selling them parts. We went to another body shop. And before you know it, we had a whole load of body shops, uh, in College Point that were taking parts from us. And we eventually opened up a chop shop. And now we Naturally. started to enterprise. By the time I was like 16, 17, I'm running a chop shop. Uh, first, we used to ditch the cars in woods. Yeah. And, you know, any parks or woods, we would ditch, you know, and then five or six skeletons would be pulled out, you know, a month or two later. Yeah. And then at some point or another, the guys started renting us warehouses. We'd do the chop shops in the warehouses until the warehouse got raided or we we walked out on a lease and left all the skeletons in there. Yeah. Um, and then at some point or another, I was in a body shop and a guy said to me, uh, there was a big tool chest and he, and we were talking about how much, he goes, it cost a few grand and yeah. the tools are a few hundred a piece yeah. and the, the truck comes and then the truck's got over a hundred thousand and I said, you want one? And that's how I started hijacking. I hijacked the tool truck. I was hijacking Snap-on trucks, Mako trucks, and eventually I moved into other trucks. How other old were you? I started, I hijacked my first truck at 17. So you could barely even drive, yeah. let alone an 18 wheel. Yeah, I don't even know if I had a license, but yeah, maybe just had my license and I'm, yeah. Well, those those were box trucks. Yeah, eventually. Okay, we, trucks. Yeah, but eventually we moved into, obviously we were doing 18 wheelers too. We'd get trucks coming out of the airport, um, regularly getting trucks out of JFK. Sometimes we'd get a tip, Sometimes the guy handed us the keys yeah. and we tied them up and we knew them. Yeah. Sometimes uh, the tip was, hey, it's coming out, but I can't help you beyond that. Yeah. And then there we took the guy. We, we took the guy. We took him at a light sometimes, yeah. things you couldn't do now. Yeah. There'd be 16 people iPhoning me on the, <laughs> and there'd be 15 cameras. And yeah, but we would take a guy at a light. We'd take a guy at a stop. Yeah. And, you know, we, we'd make him pull over. We we always found a way to get the truck. Yeah. And we did. So, yeah. 
so you have you started out doing that. Now, mm-hmm. were you kind of getting so big you were on the radar screen of the mob, or was there guys kind of in your crew that were kind of with the mob that mm-hmm. said, "Hey, you know what? You know, we need our piece." Or where yeah. did the mob kind of come in? The guys who the guys who eventually who originally brought me in uh, are active now. A couple Got of it. them. Okay. Uh, but what happens is basically uh, when you're stealing, yeah, uh, it's like you're hijacking trucks, yeah. And the mafia is the underworld government. So if yeah. you let's say you're you own a store, yeah. and eventually you don't pay taxes, let's yeah. say, but you own a store yeah. on Main Street. Yeah. Eventually, the IRS is going to knock on your door and Correct. say, "Hey, you'd have to pay taxes." Correct. It's the same thing with the mafia, who controls yeah. the underworld government. They're yeah. eventually going to say, "Hey, you're making money. Yeah. Who are you paying? Who are yeah. you with?" So that's that's the first thing. Guys started to take, you know, yeah. Hey, what are you doing? Yeah. I met a few different guys. Some were full of shit. Some were real guys. Yeah. Some I liked. Some I didn't. Yeah. And eventually, I got taken in by some guys I liked, and I eventually. Uh, ended up in within the Gambino crime family. So you're a young guy, and you know you're hijacking. You're making some money. You with some like older guys in a way. You kind of look up to them, even a mentor, mm-hmm. mentor in some way. Mm-hmm. Was that on your mind? Like, wow, maybe I can hit a button someday, and I can be in. I can yeah. be a man of honor and, and be, be untouched and make real yeah. money. Was that kind of like your, if you will, lack of a better word, career track at the time? Yeah, definitely. I felt like. Uh, it's good for you. It's good for them. Yeah. You're making money. You're kicking a piece up, but you're also you could make a lot more money By when, you, when you, yeah, you're with, yeah. you're, you're with the, the, you know, the, the, the biggest corporation. It's like if you own a little cafe yeah. and now Starbucks wants to buy you out, Correct. but keep you there, right? You're allowed to stay on even as better. owner, but it's even better. Your so franchise. you'll make a lot more and more yeah. traffic. Yeah. So yeah, you want to be part of that. I did want to be part of it. I loved it. Yeah. I learned the life I took to it. It was part of me. Yeah, uh, I lived by it. I was willing to kill or die for it. It's yeah. something that you're willing to, you know. It's like it's almost like a cult too. Yeah. The thinking, you, you know, you believe in it so wholeheartedly Correct. that you're willing to give up your life for it. Yeah. Whether it's life in prison, whether it's you might get killed. Correct. I love this thing. It's bigger than myself. It's Correct. something I'm part it's of. It's, it's a brotherhood, and yeah. it, and it felt good. Yeah. And the bonds, there's there's real human friendships. There's yeah. real bonds that you make. Yeah. With people that you never that that are lifelong. I still have those bonds with some of the guys I grew up with Correct. that I hijacked my first trucks with. Yeah. I'm still close with today. Um, so no matter whether they're involved in the life still or not, I still love them and they love yeah. me. So those are those are bonds for life. Now we know times change and even like Italian neighborhoods are not like what they used to be. Mm-hmm. But you know, me being Italian American, um, mm-hmm. you know, I was yeah, you know, my family came from Italy, lived in Elizabeth, mm-hmm. moved to the suburbs. So I was kind of away from everything. Mm-hmm. So me and my kind of network, none of us really got into crime. All Italian American got into business and mm-hmm. whatever. Being where you you were from, where you you know you got into crime, that kind of stuff. Were a lot of kids in your your space? Did the majority of them go into crime, or did a lot of guys, with a lot of successful business owners mm-hmm. out of your area? What's kind of the makeup of your contemporaries now? Both in my neighborhood. Uh, most people were hard working. Yeah. And I, I was very careful to point out in my new book, Borgata, yeah. the Italian American experience that most Italians came to this country to work hard, to put their blood and sweat into everything that they could Correct. and give their children a better life. Yeah. And I wanted to make sure that that comes across. Absolutely. My yeah. father's family was yeah. like that. Yeah. And uh, then there was the criminal element. Yeah. And I gravitated towards the criminal element. Yeah. So I found them. Yeah. That was the small niche, niche of, in the community, and I found them. I went looking for them. Yeah. They looked for me. We found each other. It's almost like if you, you know, if somebody wants to get high, they're going to find people to get high with. If somebody Correct. wants to drink, they're going to find drunks in a bar. Exactly. You go find what you want, and I found them. Um, so that's sort of like they're there. I found them. They found me. And uh, but it's really not the overall Italian American experience for the most part. Correct. Most, most just wanted to work hard like yourself Correct. and your family, and put you know make the best of the American dream. So how did it work with your family? Because you had, you know, one half that was kind of dabbling in the life and the other half very legitimate. Did that cause a rift within your family or did they accept you for who you were? Uh, so my, I hid it from my family for the most part, okay. everything I could. My fear when I was a kid, yeah. you know, when, I was a kid when I'm stealing cars, 13, yeah. 14, yeah, yeah. 15. Call, yeah. yeah, my fear wasn't the cops. I never so, cared if they were so what, the yeah. cops are going to arrest me. Yeah, who yeah. cares? Yeah. Big deal. I go to jail. I could yeah. spend a day in the jail. Yeah. Who my fear, believe it or not, was showing up in a cop car with my mother there. Yeah. You know, I didn't <laughs> want to break my mother's heart. Yep. Th- that's like, that was really yeah. all that mattered. True Italian son. Yeah, yeah. And when my mother, when my mother died, my mother died young. She yeah. got cancer. Oh, wow. Yeah, so and, and she died in my arms. I took care of her. Oh, wow. My friend Ronnie, Ronnie Gilonzo, yeah. who's my dear friend to this day, yeah. man, a man among men. Yeah. 
a true man of honor. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I don't say that about yeah. a lot of those guys. Yeah. Real man. Uh, but he reminded me one time. He said, do you remember we used to, if we were hijacking a truck, you'd say, I got to be home at 5.30 because my mother makes dinner. <laughs> and I'm laughing with him. I said, yeah, if my mother made dinner, she wanted yeah. us all around the yeah. table for yeah. dinner. So yeah. I'd say, hey, I'd leave the truck with the guy, yeah. tied up and go home. <laughs> To have dinner and meet up with them later, so it was wild. I mean, you know, I say this easy now, yeah, 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 yeah. but but anyway, it was wild. So yeah. I was always, you know, I loved my family. Uh, yeah. My mother, when my mother died, I had no more fear. When my mother yeah. died in my arms, yeah. she was only forty-seven. Yeah, when she died in my arms, I didn't care about anything. Yeah. It was hard because then I didn't have that. I didn't. I never feared the cops yeah. to begin with. Yeah. And now you don't have to fear your mother finding out about then you because she's gone. Want. Yeah. So it's like you know, it was like the leash was off. It was over. So there's a lot to unpack there because the Italian American experience is such a dichotomy because, you know, even myself, I a hundred percent legitimate guy. I've always been legitimate, but just, you have it, whether it be a family member, um, you could be whether New York or Long Island, uh, Brooklyn, there'd be a, a judge next to a lawyer, next to a wise guy, next to a cop. And it's all kind of mixed in. And it leaves, like I said, such a dichotomy. And also in a weird way, um, when I lost my mother, I was 40 years old when I lost my mother. Sorry. And although it's a, the most devastating blow, mm -hmm. you also learn to let things go and become more fearless because mm -hmm. there's always that fear of disappointing them, good mm -hmm. and bad, mm -hmm. right? Because now you're like, mm -hmm. may do things, you're like mm -hmm. stupid because you're like, are right. waiting so long. Right. But the same token, you want to make them proud. So right. I, I'm very empathetic yeah. towards that. Mm -hmm. So then you wrote this first book. Well, let's get let's continue on, on your journey because before we get to mm -hmm. mob rules. Mm -hmm. So you obviously get jammed up. I got jammed point. up. Yeah, and uh, what happened there? Yeah, so uh, I got jammed up, and yeah. at some point or another, uh, I was robbing everything you could imagine. I had, you know, I forgot the crimes I had committed. That's something, <laughs> you know, your life is a crime in progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't remember. <laughs> and I, I, literally, when the FBI charged me with crimes, I was like, did I do these? Yeah, what, yeah. You know, they, that was long ago. I yeah. forgot that one. Yeah. So eventually, they came after me. I was the target of an investigation. What happened was I was, I was taken down trucks and doing heists. And we did army cars too. I was charged with an army car conspiracy nice. in my indictment, but we were known to do them too. And uh, there was nothing we didn't do. There's yeah. actually surveillance pictures of me floating around on a computer somewhere yeah. of me in California. We went there to hit a Loomis armored car and the FBI, we, we were under surveillance. The FBI did a great job, got yeah. us off the street and let us know that they knew we were down there for something. And we should probably pack it up and go home. Yeah. And they did a great job, and they they stopped the crime from happening. The FBI to their credit. Yeah. Also, oh, that means they were really on you guys. They were on us. Yeah, they were on us. And uh, but I got jammed up. Eventually, um, what happened was my fence. He was an older guy. I called him Uncle Billy. Yeah. I named him in my memoir. I called yeah. him Uncle Jimmy. His real yeah. name was Uncle Billy. I yeah. can talk about him now. He's gone. Yeah. Uh, Uncle Billy was a huge fence in the sense that he was one of the very few fences on Forty Seventh Street, Manhattan. Yeah who could handle anything. Diamond District, right? Diamond District. Yeah. And if you brought him the Stanhope Diamond, if you brought him the Queen's <laughs> Jewels, he found a way. He got rid of them the next day or that day. You know, yeah. there's the only few people who could do that. Yeah, a lot of people- it's not easy, yeah. I mean, I brought, I brought Frederick Remingtings to people yeah. and they're yeah. like, what do I do with this? Yeah. You know, I'm gonna get, you don't, you gotta have somebody Correct. to sell. Correct. People run around with Picassos and don't yeah. know what to do yeah. with them. Yeah. So that's the worst thing you do is have Picasso because it's such a limited market. Right. You go on the radar screen just by right. selling it. But there are a lot of people who give them away because they don't know what to do with these things. You got to find somebody <laughs> who's willing to hang it in the their Gardner house. Heist. And get it. Here yeah, you go. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, so in the, in the end, he was a major fence and I brought him everything. He got pinched. Yeah. And he went bad. When he went bad, he flipped and he said, uh, we didn't know he flipped. And I called him Uncle Billy because yeah. he was my friend's real uncle. Yeah. My dear friend, real, his real uncle. Yeah. And when he flipped, we didn't know he flipped yet. We got a subpoena from the FBI. I took the fifth, but the FBI had given my attorney a list of crimes that I had committed. And on that list, we wanted to talk to Billy. So we said to yeah. Billy, Billy says, I got subpoenaed too. Come yeah. to the city. Yeah. He lived in an apartment overlooking Times Square. We said, come to the city. He says, we'll talk about it. So we says, great. So we're on our way to the city, right before the exit, before the Midtown Tunnel. I said to my friend, I said, get off, we'll go to Bertino's. Bertino's yeah. was this nice little place that an Italian eatery, yeah. the guy's mother used to cook. Yeah. So I said, go to Bertino's, nice. we'll grab a bite because we might be in Billy's apartment yeah. all night. So we got off the highway, we sat down, we're eating, and I'm going, I'm looking at my friend, I said, it just clicked. I said, son of a bitch, your uncle's the rat. I says, what? I, I said, you picked up the indictments that came over probably. Well, I says, he says, my uncle wouldn't yeah. rat. Yeah. He's waiting for us yeah. to talk about it. He got subpoenaed too. There was something though I picked up, I'll tell you what it was. So of all the trucks and heists that they listed, that I did with my crew, 
of all the heist and, and, and hijackings, there was one that, was, that we didn't remember, and then it clicked. I said, do you remember we, we were trying to keep him honest a couple of years before, maybe a few years before? Yeah. We thought he was always honest with us, Correct. but we thought for a little while he was lowballing us because we yeah. figured he knows we're always going to him. Correct. He should know we have other fences. We Correct. might not always go to him. Exactly. So I said, yeah. So I said, let's, let's throw a truck in there, yeah. tell him we're on our way to bring it to him. At the last minute, let's say we dumped it somewhere else. This way he doesn't, you yeah. know, he knows we could go elsewhere yeah. and we'll keep him honest next time. They call that a stalking horse in business. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know. Oh, it yeah. was our own little plan. Yeah. Love it. So we threw it out there. And when I realized that in the on the FBI's list of heists and hijackings, that was, one of, them. That was yeah. one of them. I said, it's your uncle. How would they know that? It was made up. It wasn't a real heist. So he said, son of a bitch, you're right. So I said, do me a favor. Yeah. If we didn't stop at Patino's, we'd have been in his house. Talking I go about. talking about it with the cameras or the audio running or the FBI in the next room. I said, we'd be done. So I said, call your uncle, tell him we're not coming in. So he gets on the horn. He says, listen, he says, Uncle Billy, he says, we're not coming in. He says, why? I says, he's, he's, no, he says, we, we can't make it. He says, why? I don't, I'm waiting for you. You got to come. We got to talk about this. Yeah. Says, then all of a sudden. He's nervous, yeah. I said. Yeah. He says, he's playing. And then he says, when are you going to make it in? I says, just tell yeah, so he week, says, yeah. we'll try, yeah. So yeah. he blew him off. I said, he's, he's the rat. That's so crazy. we only lasted another year, year and yeah, a half yeah, on the yeah. street. The FBI yeah. did a great job. They eventually found somebody else. Yeah. But he was a dry snitch. He wasn't willing to testify. Yeah. So they needed him to talk about something with us. Interesting. Yeah, and then they, we would have been dead. Do you know if he got um, eventually immunity or whatever? Uh, Well, I had the next guy they found went into the witness protection program. And I was never able to find out what exactly happened to him. He disappeared. Yeah. So we believe he was packed up and went somewhere. But the next guy they did find a year, year and a half later, went into the program. And that's when they, they came for us, that's the FBI. Crazy. Yeah. And, and I always say that, you know, you're the generation, not that you're only a little older than me, but we're kind of the generation that saw like the last mobster. You know oh, what I mean? Yeah. Like that oh, it's stuff, done. like it's, oh, it's done. Uh, people in the street, the yeah. confidential informants that are yeah. given information that, that are done. not even disclosed. Yeah. So, okay. So then you get, so then you finally get jammed up. What, what exactly did you, did you take a deal? Did you blow trial? Oh, what so yeah. There? So I had three cases. The FBI, what they did was they, they had a pressure attack on yeah. me. They wanted to put as much pressure as they could. So first they had a secret service case. And it's a big deal. I had no, I never held a credit card in my yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. Basically what happened was the secret service charged us with credit card fraud. What happened was a guy came to me and he was running credit cards through phony stores. Okay. He was opening up phony businesses, running 40, 50,000 in credit cards through yeah, these places yeah, and then yeah. closing up yeah. and he got paid back then. I don't know if you could do that today, but he yeah. did it then. Yeah. And the guy he was working with, the last place they did, the guy owed him like 50. He came to me and he says, look, I told him that I'm with you. Yeah. And he said, go F himself and this and that. So I got involved then. I says, who's he? Yeah. So I went after the guy. And then the guy produced somebody from the life. Yeah. And then I locked horns with that other guy. Yeah. And I found out the other guy was a killer. The other guy was kidnapping drug dealers for ransom, getting paid the ransom and then killing them. So I says, I got I to gotta do something with yeah. this guy. Yeah. So what they said happened after that was, first the guy tried to give us a heist to do. We didn't find anything there. And then I looked supposedly, allegedly, yeah. for the guy who was the killer. Yeah. And there was gunfire. Somebody got shot. So that so that was one case, the Secret Service case. Then there was a stick up that one of my co-defendants in the feds did. I didn't. They charged me with that. I knew they figured probably if Ferrante didn't do it, yeah. he's gonna he gonna, he's he not going to want to go away. Yeah. So maybe that'll flip him. Yeah. So I says, look, I didn't do it, but I did a million others. Yeah. So be it. I got that case. Yeah. Then they charged me the FBI with a Hobbs Act, which is like a RICO. Yes. And that was for all the heists and hijackings. So for that one. That's a serious one. Yeah, that was a serious one. Yeah. I faced 100 and maybe 150 <laughs> years for that. Each, each, each count was 10 years minimum if I blew trial. And then it, every time the gun is used in commission of a crime, it was it's, an additional five. Wow. So 15 years for each count, 10 counts, let's say, for argument's sake, is 150 years. years yeah. Might have been a little less than that. But uh, if you blow trial, you got that. So I was facing, the li facing life. With my, all my co-defendants, we fought the cases yeah. our best. I had some co-defendants who had additional cases as well. They fought their cases. I had one co-defendant who had several bank jobs in the state by himself. Yeah. I said, wow, you were active when we weren't around. Yeah. Every time we weren't around, he hit a bank himself. Yeah. So he was a little off the, off the charts with that. He was like a Bonnie and Clyde type, yeah. John, John Dillinger type. So then there was other guys I had on other cases, but we all stuck together. Nobody flipped other than the original guys. Yeah. The original guy went into the program and one other guy who flipped uh, in the beginning, but nobody else flipped. We stood strong. In the end, 
the government came, they, they were not offering pleas. So we said, all right, we gotta go to trial, what are we gonna do? And then they finally started to come down with 20 year pleas, 20 for me, a little less for my co-defendants. And at some point or another, after three years of fighting the case in MDC, Metropolitan Detention yeah. Center in Brooklyn, yeah. they said to me, if you take 13, we'll give your co-defendants 10, 9, 8, 7 down the line, they yeah. all get less than you. Because they, they had me as the mastermind, yeah. boss. Yeah. I'm no mastermind, but that's the title that's they gave they had, me. Yeah. So the I said, leader. yeah. So I said to my co-defendants, "You guys want me to take it? I'll yeah. take it." They all stood up. Yeah. I says, "What do you want to do?" They go, "Lou, we we want to take the pleas. Let's do it." Yeah. So I took the thirteen. They all got less. We packed up and went away. I found out later that the guy had violated the main snitch had violated the witness protection program. Was thrown out. So they never even had a snitch against us. So we, actually, if we kept fighting, we would eventually got the case dismissed. Wow. Yeah, there was no real case against us, but we didn't know that at the time. I found that out much more in concrete. When I reversed my federal case on a technicality, came back to court six and a half years later, and they said, where's the snitch? And they said, he'd been thrown out of the program years ago. Wow. And I was like, son of a bitch, we never had to cop. So, but look, yeah. everything's for a reason. Yeah, By the true. grace of God, yeah. I went away, did my time. I read my first book in prison. I taught myself the art of writing. I taught myself history, science, philosophy. Business, I obviously. read 18 hours a day. And I would have never, ever had the opportunity, time and opportunity to do that. Had yeah. I got back to the street, I would have went right back to the mob. And that's when my mind changed. And I says, I don't need this crap. Yeah. I'm done with the mob. Yeah. And I never ratted, by the way, either. None of my co-defendants did. I yeah. never snitched. And these are some of the best men I met in my life. What did you serve? Was like at nine, nine and a half, In the end, I got out. Yeah, I got out in eight and a half years in the eight end. Eight and a half years, yep. okay. After reversing the big federal case. And that, and um how was your time, federal time, I assume, right? The federal time was rough because they they classified me as, I had three violent felonies, so they classified me as a violent felon. Right. And then they knew that there was allegations of gunfire, so they put me in Lewisburg Maximum Security Prison. My first day in Lewisburg, first of all, I get there, I go on a bus. Yeah. So they, they take me there on the bus, and I get on the bus the morning I'm leaving. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm not a tall guy. Yeah. I get on the bus, they black box me. Uh, arms and arms and legs shackles, yeah, yeah. and I'm on the bus, and we're picking up guys along the way. And on the way along, along the route to Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, we're stopping here, stopping there, and guys are getting on the bus, and there were all these big, excuse me, big guys who are muscle bound, tattoos head to toe, tear drops. They killed their yeah. friends, knuckles, gold teeth. I'm, I, and they're getting, they're going. Can't wait to get to Lewisburg. I'm gonna kill me somebody. I'm gonna stab somebody. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do that. That place is gladiator school. Yeah. Where do we get to Lewisburg? So I think they're all going. And I'm saying, wow, where am I going? Yeah. And I'm sitting there. It's the first time I wore glasses outside of, I never wore glasses when I was on the street. I was yeah. too vain to get them. I needed yeah. them for driving right before I went to jail. Yeah. When I'm in jail now, I says, I can't see if a guy's coming at me in New York. I better yeah. get glasses while I'm in the holdover. Yeah. I got glasses for the first time. So the first time I used them, was on this trip going up to Lewisburg. Yeah. So I got my glasses on, I look like a Poindexter. I'm already reading a lot and I'm shackled and yeah. all these guys are talking all this shit. We get to Lewisburg, the big steel doors open, the bus pulls in, the guys come up with the with the mirrored sunglasses, shotguns, the whole bit. Like right out of like the Cool Hand Luke movie. Yeah, yeah. The big steel doors close behind us, we're in Lewisburg behind the wall. Cop gets on the thing, hack, guard, gets on the bus, he's got a clipboard. He says, everybody on this bus is going to a low or a medium security. You're going to be staying here in the hole for a week or two until you get your bus ride out. I got one for the pen. Ferrante. I said, wow, these guys were all bullshitting. They knew they're going to Lewisburg, but they knew they're not staying there. And they're all talking shit with each other. And here I am, the guy who never said a word, the only yeah. guy classified yeah. for Lewisburg. So anyway, I get off the bus. They cleared me for population. They got to make sure that nobody's got a death threat on you correct, or nothing. Because guys get out of, sometimes yeah. you get it to Lewisburg, you land, yeah. Yeah. you walk in the red top as soon as you get out. Yeah. Somebody got you because mm. somebody's waiting for you. So they knew I never ratted, yeah. but I had seps against me in other prisons, guys who were scared of me and put themselves on separation from me. Interesting. So they got to check you out. Yeah. And they, there was also, it was on the heels of the Colombo War yeah. from the 90s. I was close with Little Vicarina, yeah. man's man. Yeah. One, one of the best men I've ever met in my life, extremely intelligent. Little Vicarina Sr. Yeah. and Junior. Yeah. My, Junior's my dear friend. Yeah. Little Vicarina uh, Sr., who's serving life, yeah. he called not too long ago. I was on the phone with him in prison. Uh -huh. uh, great guy. How's he holding up? He's holding up good. He says, Louis, people remember me out there. I said, yeah. Of course people remember me. Absolutely. You. I said, You're a legend, Vic. Yeah. You know, you don't have much to live on when yeah. you're out there. Yeah. This, now, the son, I'm going to tell you, not only is the son a man's man, 
through and through. Yeah. But on top of that, probably one of the smartest guys I ever met in my mm. life. Extremely intelligent. Correct, he yeah. beat his Rico, his murder Rico. Good for him. And he did a lot of the defense himself. So anyway, um, they said to me, you got any problems with any of the Columbos, whether the arenas or the Persicos? Because yeah. they were at war and they wanted yeah. to keep them separated. Yeah. I said, I'm friendly with everybody. Yeah. I get along with everybody. You can put me on the compound. Let's go. Yeah. So they released me onto the compound. My so they were even like kind of cognizant of the war in jail as well. Oh, of course. They keep they try to That's keep the Persicos and the arenas separated, yeah. but they do intermingle now and then. Yeah. yeah. Back then. They yeah. do now and then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh now I walk the yard and Jimmy Coonan, boss yeah. of the Westies. Yeah. I called him Jimmy Doyle in my first book because I didn't want to talk names. Yeah. But it's okay to say now. It's yeah. a long time. Everything's yeah. done. Yeah. Jimmy Coonan said, Louie, they sent word you were coming. He goes, let me take you around the yard, introduce you to everybody. Oh, wow. Yeah, so Jimmy Coonan, uh, who, who, by the way, we as Italians treated yeah. him as an Irishman, yes, like yes, an Italian equals, godfather. Yeah, as equals, yeah. He's a Don Corleone yeah. to us. I mean, this- I think they were aligned with, the, happened to be aligned with the Gambino specifically. He did, yeah. he was aligned with the game, but yeah. as a man, yeah. in his own right, yeah. he earns respect. Yeah, top notch. By the yeah. way, he carries himself, yeah. everything. So Jimmy says, Louie, come on, I'll take you around the yard. So he introduced me to head of Latin Kings, head of Nignettes, head of, head of uh, 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 the Bloods, the Crips, and eventually he introduced me to head of the Aryan Brotherhood. That guy was as calm as you are sitting across from me. Having, I had no idea what yeah. he was planning when yeah. we went in. Starts to get dark in the yard, the gun towers. Lock up. Yeah. Everybody in. They're closing down the yard. Everybody's got to go in. We start to walk in. I said goodnight to Jimmy. I said goodnight to a few of the Italians I hooked up with yeah. in there. They were waiting for me too. And we go in, I go to my block and the alarms are going off. I said, what's going on? I see a, a, a hack and he's got like a pen and it's a piece of leather on a machete and he's walking by my cell and it's dri- dr- soaked in blood. And I said, whoa, what's going on here? That guy that I was talking to, the Aryan Brotherhood dude, yeah. He went inside, stripped down to his boxer shorts, handed out machetes to all his guys. They all stripped down to their boxes. And they had a hit list of guys that they wanted to kill. From the, They were warring with the black Muslims. Holy I had man. no idea. So he, calm as I was in the yard, yeah. talking to you like I'm yeah. talking to you now. Then he went in, off, had uh, this, like that. So he went inside and they, they hacked to death and gutted the first guy in his cell. Went to the next one, hacked to death and gutted the second one. Then they're full of blood and they're walking going for the third guy and the, the hack hit the deuces, the body alarm. He hit, we call it the deuces. He hit the yeah. deuces, the, the body alarm, the pin. The, yeah. And he sounded the alarm and ran. And that's when they just started stabbing every African-American that's they could crazy. see because they wanted to get as many in as they could. That's nuts. Absolutely. First day in population. That's my That was my welcoming to the Welcome penitentiary. Welcome to uh, Lewisburg. Welcome to Lewisburg. And I said, well, it can't get worse than this. Yeah. So here I am. Yeah. So you serve your time, you stood up, uh, mm-hmm. which is not as normal nowadays. Mm-hmm. You get out, and you talk about it in your book, Mob Rules. And and, and guys, um, if you haven't, get both books, Mob Rules, What the Mafia Can Teach a Legitimate, a legitimate Businessman. Um, this is like my go-to book. I probably taken it out over the last was about 10 years this book came out 15 about years? 10 years ago actually it has an international bestseller tag on the that's top right, that's how that's i know right. it's the older one yeah. that's right so i um I, I use it as a reference point and you talk about kind of the machinations and the parallel between cosa nostra and business mm-hmm. which again mm-hmm. ha- reason why i started my podcast mm-hmm. um how they're similar mm-hmm. so what are some of the the, the positives on the business side of things you learn from the life of cosa nostra if you had to pick one or two things from this book before we get to Borgata? Yeah, good question. And it's hard to choose one or two because there are so many things. Yeah, yeah, there's so many things you learn from that life, instinctual, that become instinctual. Correct. And, you know, it's like almost like intuitive reactions that you would have never had had you not experienced that. And I tried to convey that to the reader. If you strip away all the violence, at the end of the day, the best mobsters are businessmen. Correct. That's why a lot of times I see all these rats. I killed five guys. I killed 10. I killed 20. I killed 80. I killed 100. How much money did you make? Yeah. Wasn't that what this whole thing was about? Yep. So me, I went out every day. How much money can I make? Sure. Correct. If a guy gets in your way, you yeah. might have to do something. Yeah. You understand that. That's part of the game. It's a liability murder. Right. It's and businessmen almost, understand that. It's almost like a landlord. Do you want to throw Correct. people out all day? Correct. You, you regret to have to do it. Yes. But you might have to. Yeah. But these guys are happy about it. Yep. So I'm going, they lost track of what it's really about. That's right. So I, that's why I wanted to put into mob rules. This is what the original mob was really about, making money. Exactly. All the murder and mayhem, yeah. that's all secondary shit yep. that these lunatics now yep. made the primary goal. 
Yep. You know, it's almost like, well, how many people did you kill? If you didn't kill 20 people, I'm bigger than you. I killed 30. That's right. What? You're not how capable. Much money? Right. Yeah. How much money did you make? Exactly. Now, I, look, I'm, I've been accused in open court of shooting yeah. people. Yeah. I'm not saying I'm, you know, a Boy Scout. Yeah. But I went to great lengths to avoid violence. If it happened, it happened. Even the crimes I was committing. Yeah. I thank God we never accidentally killed an innocent person. Yeah. I knew what I was doing now was horrible and it could have happened. So I'm not saying I'm by any means, yeah. you know, free of any of that, but I feel like the mob has lost sight of itself. You yeah. know, they, they've just gone astray. And that book really tells you what you could do if you strip away the violence and you just use the business savvy that the mob uses every day when yep. they were good. You got that book. So it's pretty cool because you had Nick Pelleggi, uh, Pelleggi as um, one of the appraisers of the book. Mm -hmm. And then Rita Giganti, who I also interviewed as well. Did you really? Yeah, Rita's, oh, uh, Rita's yeah. phenomenal. I believe she's not far from here. I would actually like to get she her in, Jersey, yeah. uh, in studio, which, mm -hmm. will, which will be fun. Big mm -hmm. fan of Rita. Mm -hmm. All right, so before we get to Borgotics, I'm really, we're going to really unpack this in, in depth. Mm -hmm. um, you did a show, mm -hmm. and um, it was about uh, different countries and mm -hmm. uh, people that were incarcerated, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. My first question to you, though, you being an ex- associate of Cosa Nostra, mm -hmm. at least on film, it appeared they gave you a certain amount of respect and in some cases deference in a way. Yeah. Um, what do what do kind of, and I know maybe I'm generalizing and if you want to pick an example, feel free, mm -hmm. but what did Thailand and all the different countries that you went to, what do they kind of think of American Cosa Nostra? Um, they, do, they do, the criminal element in different yeah. countries do look up to the American mafia. Yeah. Um, I think that a lot of that has to do with a lot of the media attention the mafia gets, a lot of yeah. the movies that yeah. come out. Yeah. You know, you make a good fellas and it goes Correct. around the world yeah, in different languages. Yeah. And yeah. most people do know English as a second language. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, a lot of it comes from that. Okay. Um, and a lot of it is sort of like a, they they have a distorted view because it's of the films. Correct. It's not of the real life. So yeah. they really So, you're going in a little, little bit of an advantage, yeah. them thinking you're from that. But a lot of times, too, when it comes down to it, you still got to talk their language. Yeah. So, for example, when I went to a Zalco prison in the middle of the jungles of El Salvador. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about 600 murderers. Yeah. yeah. They run the prison. You're going to lock in and with you them. you stayed with them, right? I stayed with yeah. them. I locked in. I mean, and these were incredible guys. I hit yeah. it off with them. And, you know, they want you dead. You're dead. Yeah, yeah. They could have killed me in that split Correct. second. Yeah. Um, when I went to finally meet the head of the gang, I said to the producer, I said, give me, give me a pack of cigarettes. Yeah. And they go, no, I can't do it. Give me the cigarettes. So I stuck them all the way down in my, the, you know, the, the, the sack of my yeah. underwear. So I go through the metal detectors and everything, and I went through the prison, and I get in. And I finally see the, the boy. I go, come on, let's go back to your cell. Yeah. So he follows me back to his cell. Uh, I follow him rather back to his yeah. cell. And when I get to I throw the, I take the cigarettes out, throw them on the bunk, and he goes, you are a gangster. <laughs> Nobody would know to do that. Nobody, unless you've been there, yeah. done that. You had to have been in prison to know what a cigarette means to somebody. Correct. To be able to stick them in your balls. Yeah. <laughs> you had to be in prison. So he goes, this prison's yours. We hit it off. Yeah. We we had the best relationship while That's I was amazing. there. Yeah. And I took a liking to the guy. Yeah. Because I see people for... Who they are. Who yeah. they are. Yeah. You know, you could... You could judge an average yeah, citizen sees yeah, people different. Correct. Jimmy Coonan's a perfect example. Yeah. I tell people I love Jimmy. That, you know, I, I, I've been told, how do you love Jimmy? He had a head in a bag. He yeah. shot people up in a bathtub. Yeah. He wouldn't do it to me. Correct. Don't cross him. Yeah. I would never cross yeah. Jimmy. I know. I know how to be Jimmy's friend. Yeah. Jimmy's yeah. my friend. Yeah. It's a different story, and that's the same thing with these guys. They may kill, but don't give them a reason to kill. Exactly. You know. So it's look. I'm not condoning yeah. violence. To be sure, yeah, I'm on this side of the world now, on yeah. different side of the street. But what was the toughest? I know you did a few of them. Mm -hmm. What was the absolute toughest prison you visit, visited? I would say, um, I would say two. One is the Azalco, which I was just saying yeah. in El Salvador. Uh, they were they were killing twenty guys a day on the streets over there. They whacked the guy in the, in, the, in the prison yard right before I got there. So you know that, and they knifed him to death. He had about five hundred knife wounds, in yeah. him. so that's that was tough. Philippines. Philippines was another. Was that the one where you were the shot caller and they had like a room and dedicate? It was like yes. a yes. had like a yes system and a yeah. meeting room and a yeah game yep. room. And yeah, yeah. And that it was gets, my favorite episode, by the way. Uh, yeah, it was a great episode. Yeah. I got to tell you how how much that episode. He respected you, that guy. Oh, totally. Yeah. And we got along really well, and yeah. I had respect for him yeah. too. Yeah. Now I'm going to tell you before I'm going to give you a little spoiler before I tell the Please. story. He 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 died. 
Ooh. And we, a lot of people have been emailing me saying they believe he was murdered by the government. Now I'll rewind and tell you how that happened. When I went into that prison, it was 20,000 guys. It was called Bilibid. Yes. 20,000 guys behind this wall. It was a, they were policing themselves. They had guys walking with badges and batons. I thought they were guards. No. And they go, no, those are inmates. I go, inmates? They're the police force? They have their own police force in here. So at some point or another, there was something I could tell now. It yeah. was off the camera, but I could tell now he's gone. I said to him, I go, um, you guys got guns in here? He yeah. goes, hold the camera. So we cut the camera. Yeah. He says, I got an arsenal in here. He goes, we got AK-47s, everything. You're in a prison with AK-47s. <laughs> now, after I left, the yeah. head, one of the head gang leaders got murdered right where we were standing when we smoked the cigar at the end of the episode. Yeah, yeah. One of the gang leaders, he had a beef with somebody. The guy went back to his cell, got a 38, came out, blew his brains out <laughs> right in the prison. So they have the guns. Yeah. So just to rewind a little, we filmed the episode. It goes viral in the Philippines. Yeah. So I start getting a lot of emails and they go, wow, this was an incredible episode. Went viral in the Philippines. Yeah. We loved it. You're doing anything. You're coming back here. I was like, okay, that's believable. Went viral in the Philippines. It's the Philippines. Now I start getting emails saying, you changed the government. How did I change the government? So this was a little alien to me. And I didn't believe it at first. Then I get a, a somebody, a journalist from the Manila Times yeah. who emails me and says, can I interview you? You flipped the government here. How did I flip the government? So now I get an email from an invitation, an invitation from Rodrigo Duterte's secretary who ousted Aquino. Wow. And they said, we want to invite you to the Philippines. I have the email still. I want to invite yeah. you to the Philippines to view your documentary in front of Congress. What the hell's going on here? So I start to look into it. Yeah. Apparently, Rodrigo Duterte used my documentary exposing the, the relationship that the prison leaders had with the government, the Aquino government, to oust the Aquino government saying they're in bed with drug dealers and prisoners. Wow. And Duterte took over. So I, look, I was, it ended up in the end, Time Magazine's yeah. World Desk covered the story. So if you go to, if you go to my website, you can yeah. go to a place where it says the Philippines. Was it LuisFerrante.com? Oh, LuisFerrante.com, okay. we'll yeah. Put the, we'll put the link below. Yeah, and uh, so if you go there, there'll be something for the Philippines and you could link to the Time Magazine article, which is very interesting. And obviously, I, this was a negative effect of the documentary. I did not, I was not yeah. in favor of Duterte. Yeah. He yeah. did a lot of good stuff for the yeah. Philippines, yeah. but he was an animal with regard to no due process, no rule of law. He had his cops as vigilantes yeah. going out at night, they were seeing people. five or yeah. six guys, mowing yeah. them down, yeah. and just kept driving. It was like legalized mafia. Right. Well, the the documentary or the, or the series was good because you actually went in there because you were respected. You, had, you did have the cameras in there. You did lock in, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And you gave kind of prisoners and prison life kind of a different spin. And mm -hmm. I think it was intentional to humanize. Mm -hmm. And that's what I liked about mm -hmm. that because yeah. you really kind of gave people an opportunity mm -hmm. to say, hey, listen, you know, I messed up, but like mm -hmm. I'm kind of in this ecosystem, which mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. you know, eat or be eaten and mm -hmm. you kind of gave light to it so I, I love that and then you also got like really big in the media i remember when i reached out a few years ago um you were like big in the uk i think you were speaking mm -hmm. in the uk you've done mm -hmm. some uh some big talks some ted talks all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. um what uh how did you kind of elevate into media and how did you turn that into a business i was i was on book tour in the uk for this book uh no for my first book which was a memoir Okay. Yeah, and I was on book tour. And forgive me, what was the name of the first book? Uh, in the United States, it was Unlocked. In the UK. Yes. It was, yeah, and in the UK, I, I think guy. I had that book somewhere as yeah. well. Yeah. Yep. And Tough Guy long, in the UK. Long time ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago, and I was on book tour. But I think it was released in the UK first. No, they picked it up, actually. They picked up the secondary rights. Okay. Did yeah. it get more popular? Because I remember for some reason I it was, got it after it was big. Yeah. yeah. So why, why, it became, why it became so popular in yeah. the UK is they asked me to go into something the United States will never do. Yeah. They asked me to go into prisons and to promote literacy inside their prisons. To the UK's credit, yeah. they do care about their prisoners. Yeah. Where in the United States, we pretend to care and we don't. It's a, lock it's a them revenue up. per bed. Uh, Sheep, cattle, lock big them Big business, up. Yeah. yeah. Yep, hurt them away. Lock up, throw away the key. Rate of recidivism is high, so what? Correct, correct. And anytime I've tried to get into the U.S. prisons, they shut me down. Interesting. We don't need your help. We don't need any advice from you. Interesting. I'm an ex-prisoner. Not enough for them. So anyway, they'd rather have some schmuck who comes out of an Ivy League school telling them how to run you know, the prison. You know, you got a chat with, uh, have you heard of Chad Marks? Blood and the Razor Wire. He's a big podcast. Check it out. Shout, yeah. shout out to mm -hmm. Chad. Okay. Uh, and he was in jail. Mm -hmm. I think he was in like 40 years, mm -hmm. drug conviction. Mm -hmm. Was like a, what do you call it, a jailhouse mm -hmm. lawyer. Got himself out. Mm -hmm. 
And not I reversed only, not only is he, Yeah, not only is he out, but he's helping others get out. And right. he's really big on prison reform yeah, and that kind yeah, of stuff. Big deal. So yeah. I like shout out to Chad. But yeah. so I like the fact that you're trying to make a difference. And the funny thing is, it's more receptive overseas. So that kind yeah. of helped uh, accelerate your media. It did accelerate it. So then at some point, a production company contacted me and said, look, we want to do a show with you. And we hooked up with Discovery Channel. Yeah. They had a satellite in London, a satellite base in London. Yeah. They really had a headquartered out of Maryland. Yeah, I remember that. It was a, yeah. it was like English base. I remember that. Yeah. Then and I, you know, I tip my hat to the Brits once again because yeah. they had the foresight to say. Yeah. And this show, this prison show that I did, yeah. was the the precursor to all these other ones you see now. Yeah. We were the first ones who put it on the you know on, the, on the map, and yeah. now other people are doing it for Netflix and all this other shit. Yeah. And everybody always emails me and says, "I watched the other yeah. one. I watched this one. I yeah. watched that one. No one come close to yours, yeah. which is a nice." And you I don't have a lot of celebrity modest. outside of the U.S. Right? Obviously, Philippines. Yeah. You're known UK. Mm -hmm. What other countries are you pretty big in? Because I do remember. You were pretty popular in a few different countries. Yeah, huh? quite a few. I mean, across the globe. I yeah. mean, a lot of European countries. I've gotten off the plane in Paris. I've gotten off the plane in Istanbul where people come up to me yeah. right away. I can't walk the streets in London. People That's come up to me, which is really nice. Yeah. yeah. And you in the US, yeah. I'm one of a million gangsters yeah, talking yeah. about his past. When I travel overseas, and the overseas crowd has more respect for yeah. like a lot of these ex mob guys, yeah. they ratted. Yeah. And we used to have a thing, if you inform, you never have a chance to reform. I think a lot of them are full of shit. Yeah, and they, you know, they don't write their own books. Yeah. I taught myself how to write in prison. I read a yeah, book. Yeah, I noticed that. You don't have a uh No ghost a writer, sub writer, no, yeah. no sub yeah. writer. Yeah. These, these guys can't, you know, there's always yeah. somebody they're hooking up with, even if it's just their name, if you yeah. dig, there's somebody that ghost Correct. wrote it for yeah. them or somebody who co-wrote it with them. So I think they have a lot more respect that I did that education. Yeah. That I really said, you know, I'm going to come out of here different. I, yeah. I studied and read 18 hours a day, yeah. my entire bit. I, I didn't come out of myself for nothing. I was, what was, your, top, what was your top two or three favorite books you'd recommend? Top two or three hundred. Yeah, but yeah, say, if you have, what, it's, yeah, what made, what made yeah. it to the I'll, top? I'll, so I'll do fiction. Uh, fiction would be War and Peace and Les Mis. Yeah. Victor Hugo and Leo Tolstoy. Fair Very enough. long books. Yeah. Absolutely love them. Couldn't put them down. Uh, Count of Monte Cristo. I was going to say War and Peace. Yeah, War and Peace. Yeah, <laughs> Count of Monte Cristo was up there. Yeah, I fell in love with Thomas Hardy, the okay. Englishman uh, who wrote uh, Tess of the D'Urbervilles Correct. and Jude the Obscure. Yeah, the mayor of. Uh, How about nonfiction. Nonfiction. Uh, some of my favorite authors today would be Simon Sebag Montefiore. He does the Russians great. Correct. Yeah, I love him. Uh, you like I, a Robert Green guy, Forty Laws of Power, and that. Uh, uh, you know that that book is. Done well for yeah. itself. It yeah. circulated through prison a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, I really, really never read it cover to cover. Okay, yeah. But I know how popular it is. And Very my popular. book is probably, Mob Rules is probably something like yeah, that yeah, too. Yeah. Similar, yeah. Something along those lines. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, I got into like Martin Gilbert. I yeah. like Martin Gilbert's history, nice. histories, uh, yeah. biographies. I like David McCullough. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm like, I'm just an old fashioned bio Did biography you any, uh, guy. Gladwell? I know, Gladwell, I know Gladwell is. It's more yeah. self-help type yeah, stuff. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Right? Some business and stuff. Yeah. I, I like that a lot. My, my favorites are Robert Greenman and Mac, uh, mm -hmm. Malcolm Gladwell. But you named some, obviously, some great writers. Yeah. But I like the fact that you do fiction as well. Yeah. See, I don't have an imagination, yeah. so I don't read a lot of fiction. I but I like the fact that you uh, draw that in. But, but I, I, wrote a, I wrote a book, a, a novel, in jail. Really? Yeah, through all the race war and stuff. Yeah. You know, one day I'm reading, and I'm reading about this woman was sold on an auction block. Antebellum South. Okay. And although you taught slavery in jail, you know, the, the institution of slavery and it was yeah. horrible and then the Civil War came along, I never really like thought about it. And I'm sitting there and I have this newfound respect for people and this sensitiveness towards people that I never had. I saw guns in people's mouths. Yeah. And now I'm reevaluating my life and I yeah. regret everything I did. And now I understand that people's pain is something that's something worth thinking about Correct. and something worth having sympathy for. And I read about a woman who sold on an auction block and I started writing a book. I'm in the middle of a race war. People are killing everybody for the color of their skin. So I wrote a book about the antebellum South and the institution of slavery. It's a novel I hope to publish at some point soon. Um, nobody's awesome. ever published it for me yet. If there is a publisher out there, let me know. There because so far they tell me if you're not African-American, you're not allowed to write a book about slavery. But there are white people in the book yeah. too. So, and I'm not, I'm not white or black. Yeah. I'm Italian. There you go. So give me my shot. We'll <laughs> there, see. There you yeah. go. All right. So now. We got to talk about this. We got a rise of an empire, the history of the American mafia. I started reading it. Full disclosure came in uh, yesterday. So I tried to read as much as I could. Um, we got together last minute, but so far I am 
shocked. I mean, like, like there's a lot of books that are out there about the rise of the mob, but you kind of give an insider's point of view. You kind of give a different point of view. It's not the Lucky Luciano 1931. You kind of give a different spin. Uh, give us kind of like what the reason reasons in your opinion um, for why the mafia grew so strongly and quickly in America. Yeah. Uh, it's a really good question. Yeah. And I outlined it in there. So let me see if I could do it in a concise, yeah. concise way. Um, they left Sicily, yeah. the Italians, Correct. throughout throughout the Italian-American experience, immigrant waves that came to this country in the late 1800s, early 1900s. A lot of people sort of like hitched on to that wave who were criminals in Sicily. And I show you throughout the book how it did form in the Sicilian womb, the mafia, how it yes. came about in Sicily. And when they brought it here to the United States, there was a lot of discrimination against Italians that I point out. Yeah. And this sort of click were the type not to lay down and say, okay, they spit on us, they call us wops, guineas, grease balls, and we're Correct. just going to lay down and take it. They wanted to be in control. They wanted to dominate. And they had they came out of Sicily with this sort of like this, this subculture yes. of this mafia subculture, and they picked it up right here in the States. Yeah. And there was more of a reason for it in the States because... You're not surrounded by Sicilians. You're surrounded by Germans, Hungarians, Correct. Irish, even other Black, Italians. Spanish, even other Italians. Yeah. And how are we going to succeed here? How are we going to how are we going to advance ourselves? Correct. And a lot. I'm not discounting the horrible things they've yeah. done. Yeah. I'm just telling you that why yeah. I feel like it was it was something that they said Necessary. we have each other. Yeah. We have each other. Let's network. There's no social media. Correct. So they're going. How are we going to network? We'll network with ourselves. So they have like they literally have. They raided an attic. This guy called Morello, uh, yeah. Clutch Morello. Yeah. And these counter, he, they were involved in a counterfeiting ring. And they raided his attic and they found letters to all these different Borgatas in different cities across the United States saying, please welcome this guy. He's on his way to your city. Please welcome this guy. He's on your way to his, your city. And they would welcome these guys with open arms. Some of them were fugitives yeah. from Sicily. Yeah. Some of them were just immigrants who had yeah. nothing and wanted to you know, find somewhere where they could have something and yeah. get involved with something where they knew they spoke the same language, they ate the same food. Correct. So I think that's what really, really did it. Now, the other key was, yeah. and I point out how important Arnold Rothstein yes. was. Arnold Rothstein was like a mentor to all yep. these young gangsters. Yep. And at first I took it with a grain of salt. I yeah. kept doing more research and yeah. I said, wow, it's true. They all credit him. Frank Costello, Lucky Luciano, right. Albert Anastasia. Yep. They all credited Arnold Rothstein, a Jew, yeah. with schooling them. Yeah. And how to- how On to, the life. On the life. And yep. how to, how, look, how you, your handshake is everything. Correct. You got it. And his big lesson was, there's a million ethnic groups here in America. You're not in Sicily anymore. That's right. You better spread your wings and get with all of these people. Correct. And they made alliances with blacks, Jews, yes. Irish. They continued to form alliances. Yep. And that was the other thing the mafia did so well. I felt like, you know, whether it was prohibition, yeah. whether it was taking numbers in Harlem, Correct. they always were willing to like join with other gangs. Yeah, money was green. Money is green. Money is green. The Genovese family. Yeah. The Genovese family was the was the, the people who had gay bars all yep. over the Greenwich yep. Village before That's the right. gay rights movement. Stonewall, stone wall, yeah. called, yeah. I took over I took over a club in Manhattan, Midtown, in the in the early nineties. Yeah. And the guy who gave us the club said, Listen, gay night is your best night. Yeah. Don't give it up, he said. They spend money yep. and they don't get into you fights. You remember the name of the club? I do. I don't know if I should say ah, it though. Okay. Yeah, no, I do. Tell me off the camera. Twenty fourth between fifth and sixth. You could probably go back and find it. Yeah. That was so, near, um, yeah. around the corner from Limelight. It was, was, it was not sixth. far from everything. Yeah, yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, okay. so we took over the club yeah. and one night a week was home, you know, homosexuals. Yeah. Yeah. Gotta tell you, best customers. Oh, that's how I know it. So, you know, it comes down to green and the, and the mob, and, yeah. <laughs> and the mob is, uh, you know, the mob is, yeah. like, even the Genovese family ran yeah. all these gay clubs before the civil, before yeah. the gay rights movement. Yeah. Because they figured, you know what? This is a, a niche that nobody's got. Yeah. And we'll take it. And that's what they did with everything. That's yeah. in the business book too, Mob Rules. Yeah, I saw that. Now, now this kind of kind of on topic, but uh, get your opinion on this. You obviously, the five families at this point are, are shadow of themselves, but mm -hmm. we can kind of argue that the West Side or Genovese are still somewhat strong. Um, but a lot of it had to do with that early leadership, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm a student of this. Mm -hmm. I have maybe five bosses in the last hundred mm -hmm. years, and that's mm -hmm. probably a big one or two less than the real number versus you look at the other Borgatas are mm -hmm. probably close to 20, 25. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Is that, why do you think the Genovese family 
during your history and then even now to this day yeah. were strong and stayed strong i get in i get into it very very good so in, the, okay. in volume one the one you have in your hand yeah. yep so that that goes through the uh, reign of uh lucky luciano when, and when vito genovese took yeah. control of the family correct i end with genovese taking out costello and taking control of the family now volume two i get into it a lot deeper what their trick was and why, why they succeeded so well was after he was removed and sent away for years yeah. and died in prison, they had a series of guys that were close to him. Jerry Catina, yeah. uh, Mike Miranda, yeah. uh, Benny Squint. Yeah. Benny Squint, uh, I think Philip Lombardo. Benny Squint Lombardo. Yeah. Right? Now, Benny Squint- He wasn't was, until like the 80s. Very few people knows, you know he, he was even the boss. boss. Yeah. So he was the first guy before yeah. Chin stood yeah. in the background, yeah. before yeah. Chin like mastered that. Yeah. I'm in the background, put-, to, um, put uh, so I would argue, I would argue, and people may push back on this, but Jerry Catina might be one of the more powerful mobsters of the modern century. Absolutely. And very, very underrated in, in, in as far as the legends go. You're, yeah. you're 100% correct. Yeah. Brilliant guy. Yeah. Uh, a lot of partners with Jews. Correct. Had a lot of Jewish partners. Andrew and Myron Sugarman, his father mm -hmm. was very close with Jerry and mm -hmm. Myron did business with him as well. Yeah. If you start talking about Jerry, he will talk for five hours. Yeah. He loves yeah. Jerry. So there you go. Calls him Mr. Katina. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant guy. Yeah. Uh, so they had a lot of like top guys that yeah. must have been groomed under like the whole, the whole Vito Genovese. Correct, era. correct. Now, what happened now was between when Benny Squint had it, he kept it low key. Yes. He kept it low key yeah. and eventually retired. I yeah. think he went to Florida or something. Yeah. And then he gave it to guys who were quiet too. Yeah. And then eventually Fonzie Thierry was correct, quiet. Correct, correct. And then eventually when Chin took over, correct. now Chin had guys around him too, yeah. real men. Yeah. Quite, Chin's got the guy's Chin was with. First yeah. of all, Chin's whole inner circle. This is this is where Gotti had a problem. Yeah. Gotti's in a circle, Genie Gotti yeah. went away. Yeah. Angelo Ruggiero went away, then died. Yeah. Johnny Knig went away. Yeah. His inner circle, his best guys that Correct. he trusted from when he was a kid, yep. they were all gone. So yep. he got stuck trusting some schmuck from Brooklyn named Sammy the Bull Gravano. Good point. This was a major problem. Yeah. Chin had all these guys he that grew up with and were yeah. around him from the yeah. same neighborhood yeah. right to the end. Yeah. We're talking about Bobby Manor, That's right. Skinny Bobby Dom, Manor. Fat yeah. Dom, yeah. Baldy Dom. Yeah. All these guys were with him from from when he was a kid. Yeah. These you guys trust like, them. You trust them. Kind you know, like the guys in Philly that crew in Philly. That's I told unbreakable. You, I told you at the top of this, Ronnie Gilonzo. Yeah. I trust Ronnie with my life. Yeah. I know Ronnie through and through. Ronnie's a man's man. Ronnie yeah. would never waver. Ronnie would never back up an inch from nobody. Ronnie would give you the shirt off his back and risk his own life to save yours. Yeah. That's how Ronnie is with his friends and his family. Wow. You don't find that. How do I meet a guy tomorrow and know he's like that? Yeah, I, for those that know this show, and I'm going to own this, I had a lot of guys in the past that would give a story because they informed mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. But the guys that, um, like Ronnie G, et cetera, don't have a voice online because it doesn't come online. So I'm actually right. really happy to hear another side of it from somebody who cares about uh, a friend. I love him. And and a lot of the crap they say is wrong. Yeah. And uh, he's a man's man. You know, you guys got, you got, you got all these guys that, why well, go to the pen when you could send a friend and then they talk shit. Mm. You know, I mean, R Ronnie could could do the same, could have did the same. Correct. He goes, he goes, time to go away, he goes yeah. away. That's a man. Yeah. Little Vicarina, same thing. Little Vicarina, yep. he beat his major murder racketeering case, yeah. Junior. Yeah. The father's doing life. Yeah, father's doing life. Never said, never said a complaint. Correct. Never a single complaint. Not, and he's not well. Never. And they railroaded him because a lot of stuff came out after he was sentenced, after he was put away. That Scarpa was an informant. That mm. Scarpa had a bad handler who was giving yeah. him information. Yeah, Salvecchio, right? Yeah, yeah. and, and he, been, he got off too. Should have another... been an automatic reversal. Yeah, never gets his reversal and never complains. Little Vicarina also beats the murder racketeering case. Still does ten years. Never a single complaint out of him. Those are men. That's what Omerto was really supposed About, to be from yeah. the beginning. Yeah. Now, I'm not defending no, no, the life. No, no, no. You know, these are guys I'm hoping. In the context of your book, Borgata, and the context of Mob Rules, these are guys that decided to, to participate in this life, right? You know this. Mm -hmm. And within that kind of arena, we're just observers looking at it. You happen to be an insider mm -hmm. previously. Mm -hmm. I'm an outsider. But there's a lot to learn from that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There so, is. Yep. Yep, there is. Oh, yep. The true the true meaning of Omerta was being a man and everything. It wasn't yeah. just silence. It was now we science, think of it as yeah. just oh science, keep your mouth shut. Yeah. Cops ask you something, keep your mouth. Oh, that's yeah. Omerta. Omerta was much deeper. How to carry yourself. How to carry yourself, how yeah. to take responsibility for yourself. Well, I always say that because uh, in Sicily, a man of honor is, is only the honore, men of honor. That's right. Where here it's kind of like a made guy. They don't right. really necessarily call them men of honor. Right. And I do believe from my personal experience. Mm -hmm. 
that men from there that are at least made from there right. do act a little different. Like in their charter, they're not supposed to go to nightclubs. They're That's not right. supposed to womanize. That's right. We're here kind of. Right. We didn't even dance when I was young. You weren't yeah. supposed to dance. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you another thing. So yeah. I, I do mention it in the beginning, yeah. the introduction in my book, yeah. the first few chapters. Correct. I talk about that whole Omerta Men of Honor yeah. thing, like you said, in yeah. Sicily. There was a guy uh, who was being tried during the Maxi Mafia trials in the 80s. Yeah. In, in, in Italy. Of course. And during that time, there the, the Pentito, yeah. Rat, Snitch, yeah. Buschetta. Buschetta, yeah. He said to the guy, he was accusing him of all these multiple murders. Yeah. And the guy in his defense says, well, who are you to talk? You yeah. never took care of your wife. Yeah. Now, Totorina did that in that, Totorin. the confrontation. So in, in his, in his oh, I know, I think it was before him. It was uh, uh, Leg Leggio, Leggio. Oh, Leggio Leggio. That was a good Luciano one. That was a good one. Now, that, that guy, was a good one. in his mind, and I point this out in the book, yeah. in his mind, yeah. Murdering a dozen people is being a man, but not taking care, care of your, your wife, wife is, yeah. is beneath anyone's dignity. Correct. You shouldn't. You need to take care of your wife yeah. if you're going to be a man. Yep. So in his, you know, what was a twisted set of, yep. you know. I know it's thwarted, but you respect it in a way. Because, right. uh, and you're right, Luke, it was Luciano Leggio. Yeah. And then also in Italy, and we're going to be covering this in another show, is you can confront your, like, informant, and mm -hmm. you can confront the person right. going against right. you. Right, did And, uh. Totorina, five years later, because they, they mm. didn't catch him till later, mm. confronted Buschetta, and he just like, listen, um, my father was widowed, uh, uh, or mm. I think his mother was widowed, mm. and she didn't marry for 40 years. Mm. I'm a family guy. Mm. Um, I, and I actually interviewed Totorina's son, I don't know if you know that. Oh, really? No, yeah, I know Yeah, which is the only, only interview he did in the Is US. he done, obviously, right? If well, yeah, done. so he did eight years. So in Italy, it's a little different where, mm. like, let's just say you're in the mob here, mm. and you say, hey, I'm in the mob. Mm. It's not illegal. Right. Whether you be Freemason, mm -hmm. made member, you be part of any organization, right. just as long as you don't conspire right. in action, right? right. Um, so in Italy, they have the 41 bis laws where mm -hmm. if you say, hey, I'm in the mafia, that's mm -hmm. called mafia association, it's illegal. Right. So he did that. it, uh, Salvo did eight years. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. His brother is in for life, but he did eight years, he's out now, mm -hmm. um, he changed his life, and he tells a story oh, about, it's big in England actually, mm -hmm. he does a story about how uh, the house arena, how he was as a father, that kind of stuff. Really? So yeah. you, you got to see the yeah. other side of yeah. things. Yeah. Kind of like how you're looking I'll tell at, you. I'll tell you another yeah. thing. So we used to play we used to play cards in Richie Gotti's club. Okay. And Richie was a man too. Yeah. I liked Richie. Richie, yeah. Richie John's brother Richie, his son Richie, was a good man. Yeah. He gave me a bear hug when I came home yeah. from jail. Yeah. Well, Louis, whatever you need. He was a great yeah. guy. Yeah. We used to play cards in his club and there was there was one guy you could have a gumada, a girlfriend, on the side, within our rules, yeah, within yeah. our outlook, our our yeah. culture, our subculture. Yeah. That was okay. Yeah. But you go home to your wife and you take care of your wife. Yeah. There was one guy who did not go home to his wife, didn't take care of his wife, and we considered him a disgraciad. Yeah. Why? Because he wasn't. He was failing in his marital duties. Yeah. yeah. He's disgracing his family yeah, yeah, name. Yeah. And we bust his balls because yeah, of it. Yeah. So, I mean, it gives you a little insight into how oh. twisted we could be, correct, our, our correct. mentality, correct. but how we thought. And you know, and, and you go home to your wife. It's all yeah. right, you got to go mad. But go home to your wife. Yeah. Your wife is waiting for you. So, you know, I'm not, look, I'm not. Yeah. I so, know this is obviously going to be, I see this going to be a trilogy. And without giving too much away, mm -hmm. because we're going to put a link to the book below, um, mm -hmm. we're going to probably release some teasers before mm -hmm. with the pre buy. So without saying too much, give us a little bit of um, kind of the rise and when do you start seeing cracks in that? In oh, that. Vol volume two. Okay. So I, I really urge everyone to read volume one. Yeah. Volume two, is, I mean, volume one is Rise of Empire. The cracks begin to start in volume two, which okay. is Clash of Titans. People are at each other's throats. The, the the empire has been built, yeah. and now people are fighting over the empire. Not giving too much away. You're there in the 70s, 80s, early 90s. Uh, the, well, Volume One goes up to 1960. So yeah. the Kennedy administration takes charge and goes after the mafia like never before Correct. in Volume Two. That's when the beginning of the end sort of can be seen. Little yeah. fissures. Yeah. Now it doesn't. The end doesn't really happen until the animals are let loose and the barbarians, mm -hmm. you know, have invaded. In volume three, which is Autumn of Empire. Wow. And that's when all the so you murders. So parallels to the Romans. Absolutely. I use that's the Romans. That's a beautiful parallel. I'm a student of Roman history. Wow. I use the, the Romans were constantly, the, 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 the comparisons were constantly popping up in my head. Constantly. And I use, I draw some of them in there, some of the yeah. comparisons. 
But the well, I believe in the Roman rules, you drew some comparisons there as I well. I did, you know? I did, yeah. That's yeah, why I'm, I like yeah, so I'm a student of Roman history, yeah. so, and I enjoyed it. And, you know, Greco-Roman history, too. The Greeks are, I'm yeah. a big fan of the Greeks. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, Athenian history, is, yeah. to me, Spartan history, you know, the whole thing, I love it. And, you know, it's pre-Roman, and I love it. That's so, amazing. Yeah, so I see the, the parallels. Wow. Yeah. So, Borgata, uh, Rise of the Empire, Louis Ferrante, A History of the American Mafia. we we'll put links below. Uh, to get the book, um, if you see watching this teaser, uh, there will be links uh, to the pre-buy. It's going to release some of the teaser before uh, the pub date, and then this has been out. We're going to put links to this. My personal favorite: Mob Rules: What the Mafia Can Teach Legitimate Business Man. So, Louis Franti, I'll give you the closing words before we wrap up. Uh, I just want to thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate you. Uh, it's my pleasure. Having it's me been on. An honor yes. for me. It's a big deal for me. Back here, back at you, and. Uh, Thanks for getting into the book. Yes. Yeah, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, and uh, I look forward to covering volume two with you. I can't believe it. And then yeah. I'm going to Florida and come look you up, man. Cool. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks, brother. Thank you so All much. Right. Pleasure. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you.